Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom King. I write comics for DC Comics, sometimes for Marvel. And I'm here to introduce... I don't like to call people legends. People get mad at you when you call people legends. I just want to introduce you one of the geniuses of the medium um, who says he's semi-retired, but he's still geniusing out there. Uh, you know him from such works as uh, Martha Washington, all the things behind me. Uh, Batman v. Predator, Kingsman, uh, The Originals, a lot of Green Lantern, uh, Future Shocks, 2080. And I think that's it. That's probably the end of his career. This is Mr. Dave Gibbons. Hi, it's Tom. Hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Jeez, do you know how fucking nervous I am interviewing you, man? You are yeah. ruining my Sunday. I just want you to know that all the way from I do. America. I know exactly how nervous you are because I know what a huge nerd you are and how important this, this is to you, Tom. But relax. You're in good hands. I'm a professional. The conversation oh. will flow. Everybody's going to go home happy. Thank God. I, 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 I was genuinely like... I, I, you know, I lined up your works behind me, and I couldn't find yeah. my copy of Future Shocks, uh, which I realized I lent to my son, who stupidly lost it. So yeah. I'm running around after my son now, so you've cost me the relationship with my children. Is how well, I, I mean, that's kind of a detail. I think your set dressing is is really, really good. And to be honest, amongst all that work, my, my entire amassed life's work, a volume or two is never going to be noticed. <laughs> I, don't, I was missing some Captain America. I was sad. Some Green Lantern stuff. I'll find it. We'll we'll do this again. I'll do I'll do I'll do okay. some CGI and put it back in. All right. All right, Dave. So I want to do this. You can object. I want this to be a conversation. So you take this wherever you want. If you want to talk about wine and, and anything, uh, I'm perfectly cool. But I have the idea that we should just go through how to create a comic book because I read your book, How to Create a Comic Book, back here. How do comics work? Yep. And I had some disagreements with it. I was like, who is this Dave Gibbons to think he is? No, uh, uh, no, but I think I have different approaches than you do on some ways and some ways the same. So I thought we could for an hour sort of go through from like having an idea for a comic to actually, you know, putting letters on a page, like from the big to the minute. And as we go through the conversation, talk about your works, because I have questions about them all, because I just did a huge reread and they're fucking brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot say how much I envy you as both a writer and well, I can't even say envy for an artist, but you're, uh, it's incredible. Um, so is that cool if we just go through how to do a comic book? That's that's fine. You sound like the most organized interviewer that I've ever experienced. So <laughs> I place myself in, in your hand and let's go on the adventure film. Look, I made notes. Wow. Look, that's how I, this is pre-prepared, man. This is all I've been Look, doing. I've got notes as well, so I don't forget people's names. That's what I've come to. <laughs> so it's, it's, Tom, it's pronounced King, Tom. k Tom, Kit, and you work with that guy, Mitchell, Mick, Mike, what's his name, you know? Look, both of us work with guy, have worked with geniuses whose beards are intimidating to our bald heads. So True. I think we have, we have this in common. And I think, <laughs> I think they almost do it to mock us. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's start with the big. So someone comes to you. Uh, it's Karen Berger. It's Len Wein. It's uh, DC Comics. It's an indie. Someone comes to you and says, I want you to write a comic. Mm -hmm. Where do you start? Do you start with your own life? Do you start with some genre you love? Where does Dave Gibbons, do you start with like what you want to draw? Where do you start? Well, I suppose, like you, I've been reading comics for so long that I've got kind of half-formed ideas for all sorts of characters and all sorts of situations and all kinds of ideal ways to do a Western or to do a science fiction thing or a war thing. You know, you've kind of got this these kind of half formed things that you can build on. Um, I also for a long time have kept a notebook where when, whenever I hear a piece of dialogue that I think is really cool or I read a fact in a book or I find myself in conversation or maybe overhearing somebody on the bus or something like that, I'll just kind of write things down. And so one of the first things I would do if somebody came to me would be to get my little notebook out and to think, is there anything in here that could apply to this project, you know, is, is, is there any little, because it's a bit like, um, I, I've made this analogy before, I don't know if anybody out there's ever done chemistry when, when they were at school, but yes. there's a thing that happens where you can drop one element into a solution of another, and it will just crystallize, and it will do it almost instantly. And I've often, I say often, occasionally had that experience that you've you know it's got to be like kind of Captain America or something, and you'll get one of these little elements from somewhere else and drop it into it, and the whole thing will kind of spring alive. Um, 
I think also um, it's good not to be too rushed at that stage of things. And I've been very lucky because most of the projects that I've written, I've written as kind of one-offs. They've been mini series or they've been a single issue of something. And I've normally had plenty of time to kick the ideas around and figure out what I'm going to do. What is really hard, and I did find it hard in my limited experience doing the Green Lantern Corps at DC, is to come up with ideas and approaches month after month yeah. after month. That's the difficult thing. Speak. I, I have the hardcover behind me of your Green Lantern Corps run. I'm pointing so people can buy it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It yeah. It's yeah. brilliant. And, and, and I mean, you know, each writing assignment is a bit different. In the case of the Green Lantern Corps and the most recent writing that I did for DC, it was very much tied into events that other people were involved with. And there were bits of plot left dangling and bits of plot you had to leave dangling. It's a different experience. It's a really interesting experience. It's quite a maddening experience, sometimes <laughs> frustrating. Because, well, I mean, a case in point with... Um, before I did the Green Lantern Corps, I did the Ran Thanagar War, which was one of these things where you, you just got a handful of unused characters and stuffed them in, in, into a story. Um, and I had a great ending for it. It was going to be fantastic. It was the Green Lantern Corps arrive and they saved the day and they turned the planets green again. Uh, and I kind of I had this big ending plan. And then Peter Tomasi called me up and said, <laughs> oh, Dave, you're going to have to lose a few pages because at the very end of your story, the heavens have to open and a giant hand has to reach through from beyond and scoop everything up. And it was like, <laughs> you, you know, you, you've been upstage before you've even started, you know. So you, there are always complications like that. But on a good day, you've got a character you enjoy and you've accepted the assignment because you think you can do something with a character, as was the case with Captain America or Batman and Predator. And then you just kind of stir the soup a bit and you put some ingredients in you've already got. Maybe you'll get some editorial suggestions and then you'll kind of reach the point. And I don't know if you've ever felt like this to terribly mix my metaphors. It's almost like being pregnant, I guess. I've never been pregnant, but if you were pregnant. <laughs> sure. It does, we've all been pregnant, Dave. We know. Yeah. You know, it does come that point where you're going to have to give birth and you sort of that moment arrives and then you just do it. You just yes. put it all down there. So. That's kind of how that stage of it will typically go. No, I found I find number one issues are the easiest to write because they've been in your head for six months and you're sure. almost relieved to just puke them out. Because I feel like, I'm like yeah. a first issue is just your pitch. It's like the idea you had. The rest of the story, that's the hard part. But the first issue for me is that was that was just the concept. And so that's the Yeah, well, it's true. In, in music, they call it the difficult second album, don't they? You know, <laughs> when you, you come up with a great first album because that's all you ever wanted to say about Batman. And now you've got to fill another 20 issues with it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, I've had this similar series here where, where it's when they give you a character, you have to find that just that other element that can't come from comics for me. It's like I have to find, um, if I'm working from Batman, oh, I love, you know, Rio Bravo, that Western. If I add Rio Bravo plus Batman, that's an idea for me. Like Yeah, that or another thing which I've always found quite useful, and indeed it was Alan Moore who I think mentioned this to me. Who, I don't, I, I, I'm not familiar with his work. Uh, yes, I think you are, Tom. I think you're being a bit of a nerd now, so let's just move along. <laughs> so, so, but he said, there's, this, there's the story, there's the plot, but then there's what the story's about. And yeah. I think with the best stories, they're more than the plot. They're about something that you've got a view on or that, you, that has an emotional resonance for you. And if you can put that element into it, then it transforms it. If it's just this happens and that happens and this happens and that happens. But if indeed it's about betrayal or it's about fear or it's about triumph, you know, then you've got something that gives it breadth and gives it solidity. I, I feel the same way. In fact, when I come up with an idea, I think I start with that sort of whatever thing I want to write about, like um, mm -hmm. strange adventures. I want to write about corruption or whatever. And then then come the settings. First it goes theme, then settings, then characters, then plot. The plot's always the problem. And I always find as a writer, I care the least about the plot. The plot is yeah. like something, that's just what I'm hanging all my shit on. Mm -hmm. And and where it's the, but I think that's almost to a fault because I feel like the reader doesn't realize this and they care so much about the plot that almost the creator and the reader are sort of almost at odds sometimes I feel like. Yeah, the plot is a kind of, uh, I mean, I mean, 
although I've been in this business longer than you, you've probably written more comics than I've written. I mean, I've kind of picked my place over the over the years, so it, I wouldn't want to personally lecture you on how to do it. But oh, it's, it, I, I write. But you have to draw things. Drawing takes a lot longer. I don't know if anyone ever told you, but it's it's. I've noticed it's that. <laughs> I've noticed that, and you only get the same credit. You spend four times as long, and if you even get a credit, you only get. <laughs> But, but yeah, the, the kind of plot side of it to me is always the mechanical thing. It's the kind of like the left half of the brain. It's a puzzle. This happens and that happens and this happens. And meanwhile, this happens and then that meets that. But what it's about is the thing, as I say, that gives it emotional resonance. It's the right side of the brain. It's the, the kind of more um, uh, intuitive side of things or more yeah i see what a wonderful writer i am i cannot think of an appropriate word but you get the idea anyway. no, but it's what you remember um about i mean like uh, i think it'll work like originals when i look back on originals in my head i'm not thinking of uh the murder or the sort of the, the fight between the gangs i'm thinking of the tone i'm thinking of those uh, futuristic scooters i'm thinking of the party scenes i'm th it, it's the plot is something you like you occupy while you're in the book but the mm -hmm. sort of theme is what you sort of take away from it it's that impression it's almost like impressionistic painting you know it's like yeah. that's not what the world looks like but it's what you feel when you look at it yeah it's almost like the the plot is the structure that you hang the interesting stuff on that's right yeah, yeah. i always tell people uh, watchman is just a murder mystery i mean he created a cool world but the murder mystery is there so the person can explore the world and that's the oldest plot you can come up with that's like if you're a writer and you're just like I I love this world I love these characters I don't know what to do with them just have someone kill another person and have them solve the mystery that's how to sure. basic plot number one the quest the you quest know? that's right <laughs> <laughs> all right so you've got an idea you have this, what is what's your next step are you a note taker do you plan out the whole thing do you do all twelve issues do you do all twelve issues or do you are you talk to an editor you do it all by yourself what's your next step after you have the sort of initial idea. Well, I think the next step is you have to get something down, usually in writing in, or in, uh, yeah, usually it would be writing. I scribble stuff down in a notebook and it might often just be this happens, that happens, this happens, that, that happens to get an overview of it. You know, I've always been a great believer. And in if I ever give a talk about creating comics, whether it's story or whether it's art or whether it's creating anything, I've always found it's a really good idea to work from the general to the particular. So in other words, you have to have a general feel for the shape of the story and where the highs and lows are and um, um, the kind of, God, I'm struggling for a word again, almost the texture of it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. And just get that down in general terms. You're going to be writing notes that nobody else is going to even see. So that is the time when you can just open your mind and just throw it all down there. And then once you've got it down, it kind of, it, it then has a shape. And it and it, because you've created something, even if it's not the thing, you've got something you can edit and play with and move around and add bits in and take bits out, maybe come up with a whole different way. Often in the process of doing that, you think, oh, no, no, I've come into this the whole wrong way. There's a much better way to, to, to come into this. And actually, now I come to, to write it out, that ending's a bit flat. So I need something earlier on to give more weight to the ending. So it's that kind of really plastic, unformed thing that I think is always really important. And as I say, it's great not to be rushed to do that. Because quite often your most interesting ideas are not your first idea. They're your seventh idea, you know. Um, so then having done that, uh, you would probably at that point neaten it up and turn it into some kind of outline that you could present to an editor or a collaborator to say, this is kind of what it's like. And then knowing that you're on the right track, then I would probably do a more detailed breakdown that kind of thing where you have, um, some people call it an outline, where you'd have um, a paragraph per page of story with maybe okay. a sentence for each picture and just kind of write it down to, to, to see, see how it goes. This happens, that happens, this happens. Meanwhile, change of scene, big picture, you know, just just to kind of get, get a vague view of it. Um, Please. Do, do you think, I mean, we're a collaborative medium. You've been on both sides of the collaboration. Do you think, do you adjust the story to your artist? Do you hope the writer adjusts the story to you? At what point are you thinking, how can I, 
I mean, if you're the, if you're the artist, like, man, I don't want to draw this freaking horse. I don't want to draw Wester. I, I mean, how, when does the art, the thought of the artist come into this? Well, in, in my experience, and you know, I have been lucky enough to work with some geniuses. Um, Frank Miller, Alan Moore, Pat Mills, you know. Miller. Um, you dropping names I've never heard. <laughs> <laughs> These guys know about comics and they follow artists and they know about artists and they know what it is in the artist's work that, that speaks to them. So they will write to their strengths, write to the artist's strengths. And it's ridiculous to do anything else. And most often what will happen as well is before you even write a word, you'll know who the artist will be and you'll have a conversation with them and say, you know, this is the kind of thing I want to do and just get their input. And it's a very wise thing to do because if they're a decent artist, they've got thoughts about these characters that you've never had that you can, that they will give you <laughs> and <laughs> yes. they can make you look re really good when you incorporate them in the work. And plus also as an artist, it's always good to, to feel involved and that the, the writer can be bothered to take notice of what you think. The worst thing in the world as an artist, and it happened to me a lot, particularly in the early days, is to be given a script that you know a writer has just banged out in an afternoon without any thought. And then no, you never. Any... We've never done that. No, it never has happened. We've... I'm sure you, you it's have. It's always happened, full effort. Some some naughty writers have, and and you and you've then got to spend a month sitting with this stuff. You know, at least if you've had input, and at least if the the writer has has consulted you, even if the story isn't that good, at least you've got an involvement in it. It can work the other way, actually. That sometimes you, in the old days, you get a script that was so bad, there was no other way but up. There was probably <laughs> nothing you could do. <laughs> that wouldn't improve it. So that was when I had actually, paradoxically, some of my most creative breakthroughs because I just draw it however I felt like it, and I, I change change it round and disregard what the artist had, what the writer had written. And sometimes because it didn't matter, there was nothing to lose. So just do anything, you know. So, and it can be intimidating, obviously, to work with. You, you know, if you've got a Frank Miller script or an Alan Moore script. This is something that's going to be left, left, leave its footprint in the culture of humanity forever. And you don't want to be the one who kind of didn't get it right. So yeah. that can be intimidating. Although, really, you know, if you're having, if you're writing with, if you're working with somebody you like and admire and is a friend, it's just great fun. I mean, I get this impression with what you do with Mitch, for instance. You know, you and Mitch obviously know everybody know each other very, very well. Yeah. You share a sense of humor, you share an approach, and it's just great fun. It's playing a game with a friend. Is, is that your experience? I'm sure it must yes, be. Yes, yeah. I, I mean, I've done all of it. I, I've done, yeah, I mean, I'm the godfather to Mitch's son. You know, like we're, we talk every single day. But I mean, I've had experiences where I did Omega Men where I never, uh, Barnaby uh, Begenda, who's a brilliant artist, lives in Indonesia, talks through an agent. I've never seen him. I couldn't recognize him out of a crowd. Like we mm -hmm. never even exchanged an email because it was all through his agent. So I've done like both extremes, uh, um, but yeah, it, it's much more fun if you're playing with someone who, who do that. But it's also more pressure. Like if I'm writing a script for an artist I know, then I'm like, crap, like this person's gonna get this script and hate it and email me and tell me. Like but sometimes it's better to send it to someone anonymous. So they're just like, okay, the editor told me to draw this, I'll draw it. And then, and then in those times, like I don't mind doing like, oh, I'm gonna put 11 panels on this page. If I put 11 panels for Mitch, he'll be like, dude, I, I can't have dinner with my family tonight because he's just fucking. <laughs> So yeah, it's a personal it would, aspect. Of it. it would be a shame to lose a friendship with somebody over an overstuffed crowd scene. That's what I'm saying. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah. I always run back. I'm like silhouettes. Put everybody in silhouettes. That's cool. I love silhouettes. And of course, when you become more experienced as, as an artist, there are ways around crowd scenes. You know, well, how do you, you get around crowd scenes? What's the secret? Well, have a oh, couple that. of really big figures who obscure. <laughs> <laughs> the implied crowd behind them is one way to do it, or silhouette isn't a bad idea, or yeah, things things recede into the gloom or into the brightness, you know. But uh, yeah, it's uh, but 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 again, this is where, in terms of time, the the writer can often the writer can often win over the artist. But in a way, I'm sure the stage that I've spoken about, where as a writer you're trying to get that idea, and until you've got that idea, you've really got nothing. At least as an artist, what I've always found is you've always got a script. You can always draw something. You know, once the pump is primed, you can just run. 
Whereas with an, a writer, the problem is to get that pump primed. You know, that's the that's the imponderable bit un until the train starts running. But I imagine, we're, like I've talked to JRGR about working with Frank Miller, and he'll be like, yeah, there was a whole issue where he just put two words down and I drew it and then he lettered it later. And it's brilliant. I mean, I imagine you've gotten some fairly open scripts over the years. Yeah, well, I mean, in the case of something like Watchmen, that I think that's my first mention of it today, isn't it? I think so. In the case of something like Watchmen, that's again, I had long conversations with Alan, but what I get from him would be a fairly, uh, you know, finished, detailed script. Although it would always give me alternatives. He would never say, you must draw this. He'd say, you could do this or you could do that. But if you've got a better idea, just do it. But it, but from the time I got the script, you you knew how many pages it was. You knew what pictures were going to be on which page. You knew functionally what was going to happen. So it was a really interesting contrast to then work with Frank Miller on um, Martha Washington, where he would send you maybe just an outline and you start drawing it. And then, as you say, he'd, he'd, he'd re revise a whole sequence and say, let's put another full pager in here and let's get rid of that page and save it till here wait he did and, after you drew it he would add more pages he literally draw more this and that yeah yeah that's and, and, i've never done that that's insane well it was great because it was like jazz it was like kind of okay i've done this now you do that and you know <laughs> and so i mean the analogy that i always make is of alan as mozart and frank as miles davis you know both geniuses but a different approach um, and yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I don't mind either way, as long as it keeps me on my toes, as long as what I'm drawing is of enough interest to me that I want to draw it. I, I don't mind which approach I go. When I write for other artists, I like to think, and I'm not comparing the quality of my work to Frank or Alan, but I, I'm such I an arrogant guy, dude, give that's your reputation finally is coming out. I was going to say, I don't make that comparison because clearly I'm superior. To oh, yeah, no, 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 of course. Yeah, no, that, that's how I took it. I think so. But, but <laughs> I, I, I do tend a little bit more towards the, the Allen school where I want to write everything down just in case there's an idea in there that really sets the artist off and I don't not want to say it, you know. Um, but um, so that's where were we in this progress thing? It we was. <laughs> We haven't even written the first issue yet, nor are you. Oh, my God. What's the time? I'm like, we're, we're never going to do it, Tom. We're never going to do it. Find the editor. Quick, find the editor. Get your excuse in first. That's always been my, my strength. Get your excuses. Um, so then once I'd done the outline and once I'd done, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying, a paragraph, a page, a sentence, a picture, as it were, because that's what you have to remember about comics. It's the... It's the relationship between things. It's the relationship between the content of the pages, one to another, and the relationship between the panels on the page. So you have to get that nailed down at a fairly early stage. Then what I would do is I would actually, I get like a like a legal pad, something like this, you know, like, like a pad like that. And down the middle of it, I, this is a great pro tip, Tom. You can use this in your own work if if you like. And we'll why, know you. Why are you royalties now? I don't your know. Your work too will elevate suddenly and magically. <laughs> it's, what I do for each page is just draw a line down the, the middle of the page, and I think on the left I'm going to write the panel description, and on the right I'm going to write the dialogue, and then I'll probably write the pa or scribble the panel descriptions like long shot Batman, you know, Gotham skyline, the Batmobile screeches around the corner, Commissioner Gordon steps out. So I'd have kind of very brief, terse notes of what, what the content was going to look like. Right. And then I'd write down dialogue or captions just as they occurred to me down the other side. And then it's the longhand? You don't dissolve? Yeah, dissolve yeah, anything? kind of, yeah, scribble that probably no, nobody else could read. Then what I would do is figure out which balloons or panels went in which picture. So I'd then connect them <laughs> together and, and see if it worked. And it usually does more or less work. Again, because with experience, you kind of know what, you're, what you have, the information you have to have in. And it's then a question of relating it to the other bits of information. So I would then probably go through the whole issue or the whole story. 
and I'd end up with words with descriptions and words. And then from there, I would probably write the script. Um, and I would do that probably, I've got very fond of using something like Final Draft, which is a screenwriting um, software, but it's quite handy because you've got um, an appearance for the descriptions. The character names are always clear. You've got a short, narrow area to write dialogue in, which is quite useful because by the time you've filled up a couple of shortened lines, you've probably written enough for that panel. Right. Um, so what I would do is I'd write the script and I'd probably quite confidently type all the descriptions in of the, of the pictures because I kind of know what they look like. Then I would spend a little more time polishing the dialogue because that's the critical thing. And the thing that I love about polishing dialogue is reducing it down to its minimum of saying the most with the least words. And that to me gives me huge satisfaction to do that. Um, and um, I was rather inspired in that area by, um, again, I will mention Watchmen, an experience I had on Watchmen where there was a sequence that Alan had written in the script. It was where Rorschach, character you may have heard of, and um, I've never heard of him. Uh, well, I've never, yeah, anyway. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the bit, it's the bit, how playful do I want to be about this? Um, it's it, very it's, playful, is the answer. Very, oh, very playful. Yeah, it's, it's the bit where Rule Shack is having a, a night out, having a fight with Ozymandias in his Antarctic castle. Yeah, and they're while slamming they're each, other each, each other out. There's a load of exposition going on, and I tried to draw this, and I had to phone Alan up, and I said, "Alan, this is great stuff, but this, there are too many words to be said." In the time that it would take the action to happen so it, i can't make it work he said dave i thought exactly the same leave it to me and the next morning i got those pages completely rescripted, just as good as the originals just as beautifully written but in half the number of words and i thought wow that's that's writing you know so that's something that i always try to do with stuff that i write is not to cut it down to the point of being like a telegram you know but to try and get the maximum value for the words that I've got in there. Well, I mean, the, the problem with comics, which I face every day, is uh, the pictures look a lot prettier than the words, and you want to get the you want to get more out of the pictures than you get out of the words. At least for me. But if you mm -hmm. don't put enough words in, the comic reads too quick. Like you, you, you can if you just if you minimize it too much, then it just becomes a flip book. I, and I've erred on that side where I just read. I was like, oh, that took me three minutes, and someone paid four dollars for this. Like. It, it, it's it's this war between those two uh, factors for me. It is, and and I think that's what true masters of comics. Do. I mean, that's a huge talent. What well, of all the people I mentioned, but of Frank Miller, you know, he knows just when to turn the soundtrack on and just yeah. when to turn the visual track on and when to turn it off and how to juxtapose them. Because that's one of the fascinating things about comics. Is it is that relationship that interaction of words and pictures that has the effect it's not the picture as it stands or the words as it stands it's like you mix them together and you get a flavor that just wasn't there before and you can counterpoint things and you can emphasize things and you know that that is where to me the true art of comics lies not in writing grammatical or exciting speeches or in drawing wonderfully rendered images. It's the bit that overlaps. And my theory is, I mean, a lot of the best ever creators of comics have been people like Frank Miller or, or Will Eisner who do do the whole thing. Or Dave but, Gibbons, yeah. I hear rumors that you've- Well, you're very kind, you're very kind. And um, <laughs> too kind, but, but- I just spent a, two weeks rereading your work. You're a fucking genius, man. You're going to have to face right, up to I'll, it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take it, fine. Um, now you made me forget what I was going to say. Oh, no, I, I, I know what I was going to say. And in the case of writer and artist teams who have huge success together, it is because they both overlap that bit in the middle sympathetically. You know, that, that although there are two people, they understand the bit in the middle. And I think, again, this comes from working with somebody you know really well. Like we were saying, like with you and Mitch, you kind of, you know when to step in, you know when to leave it, leave it to the other guy. And that to me is the fascination of comics. It's that 
hard to define middle area where it chimes or it doesn't. It's it's it still fascinates me. Have you had and you explain what it is? Have you had times in your career where you haven't hit that chime, where you've read something and you said, "Oh, I fucking missed it." Well, how do I? What? Because I I've done that. I mean, I I've reread books and I've been like, "Oh, I just ah, I'm swinging a miss here, Tom. Let's start again." Like. I, has it ever happened to you? Just everything just comes out perfect. Well, uh, that everything comes out perfect, or everything comes out. <laughs> but wherever have you had 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 a time where an artist draws something and it just it doesn't match what you want it to be, and you can't oh. find the words to capture? As as an artist, you must have sort of like, no, that's not how I would do that at all. That you 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 you've missed it. Well, uh, I mean, I must say, overwhelmingly, and and again, I mean, I have been. I'll take all the compliments you you want to give me, but I have been very. I have lots of compliments. Today. Thank you. Well, let's. Have you read Batman well, v well, Predator? It's one of my favorite Batman stories of all time. I cannot believe how good that book is. Brilliant. Let's sprinkle the praise throughout the process. <laughs> not it all in one small area. Well, um, it's a deal. Um, but I, I've been very lucky with the writers that I've drawn pictures for, and I, I've been really lucky with the the artists that I've written for as well. I mean. I've had my stuff illustrated by like Mike Mignolia, Mike, Mike Mignolia. Mike yeah, Mignolia. that Aliens book, that. it's so good. I don't have a copy, but I read it. The, it <laughs> it's so good, guys. If you haven't checked it out, it's... Um, and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, heard Ivan Rice, um, Steve Rude, you know, these are wonderful talents. And I must say that almost without exception, I've always been thrilled with what I've got back. I always have thought, God, you're making me look so good. You put stuff in there that is absolutely right, but didn't didn't occur to me. And so I've been quite lucky like that. I think on the other hand, you know, you have to approach your work with a bit of generosity of spirit and think, well, you can't you can't hit the ball every time. You know, you're bound to have the odd miss. But there is and you do in your own work, you know, you look at your own work and you think, oh, what was I thinking about? Why didn't I just take 10 more minutes and just draw that place <laughs> properly, you know? Um, and indeed, there's the thing, while we're talking about the creative process, I don't know if it happens to you as a writer, but, you know, as an artist, every job I do, every time I start, it's going to be the best thing I've ever done. It's, it's going to be, it's great. It's going to be, because otherwise, how could you start? Yeah. And then you start to do it and you think, ah, oh, this isn't turning out right. This is, this is work. I'm supposed to enjoy this. This oh, look at that. I just can't, look. I can't get this page right. I'm just going to have to move on to the next page and do it. And then you go back and you ink and you think, oh god, I haven't got time to fix it. And then you look at the, you send the finished artwork off, and you're expecting the phone to ring because this time the editor is going to say, Dave, you know, you've just blown it this time. This is the one. This is the end, end, end of your career. But they don't. They phone you up and they go, oh, oh. We got it, Dave. It's great. And you think, oh, you're just saying that. You just become a nice guy and you don't want to say bad things. And then it comes out in print and you look at it and it's awful and it's mistake after mistake. And you ne never want to look, look at it again. Two years later on, you're going through your file drawers looking for something else. And you come out, you find this issue that you hated and you look through it and you think, no, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> that's right. Great. It's the best thing I ever did, but it, it's okay. And I, and this is advice, not for you particularly, but that I would pass on to my fellow art, artists and writers. I'm sure you've all had that experience. The main reason it happens is that you were the only one who saw in your head what it could have been when you started off. It's going to be the best thing ever. Only you ever saw that. All anybody else ever sees is the result. And if the result is all right, then it's all right. So you're the only one who gets that disappointment. So be prepared for it if it happens. Don't stress about it too much. Move on, get it done, move on to the next issue because it could be that issue which is going to be the best one you've ever did. Whenever I read my own work, I feel I feel like whenever other people's work, I'm like, everything in here was necessary. Like, they did this on purpose. They put this exact sentence, this exact picture. This is their plan. And I have to interpret why they did this. But when I read all my own work, it all feels contingent. I was like, did I just do that because my dog barked and I had to walk out of the room? I would like, I, I feel like I, I read my own work as I, I want to constantly re-edit it. Like, like it's hard to sort of accept that this is in stone. I mean, that, that, that to me is the problem. I was like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, th th that's true. And of course there, there, there is that thing that, that your work tends to be almost like 
like a soundtrack or a sort of the thread of your life, you know, and you can. Even years after, I can remember where I was when I drew a particular thing or what frame of mind I was in, or often sometimes what album I was listening to when I drew it. You know? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's so strange. So the, it, the work becomes such an intrinsic part of your life. I mean, it shouldn't be the only thing, I'm going to get very philosophical, it shouldn't be the only thing that gives your life value. But what? Now bearing... you tell me? I'm deep into this. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> but it, it does have some pictures of my kids. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would I would say this with the the originals, which you've been very generous about, because I wrote and drew that myself. It's which was so, the, if people don't know, the originals is a, a a futuristic graphic novel, but it's about sort of your experience in the '60s as a mod, and yeah. it's it's brilliant. It's it's a combination of memoir and futurist and and moral dilemmas and just added. Yeah, I love it. If anyone has, doesn't get that book, the hardcover just came out. It's back here from Burger Books, and it's. Gorgeous. Well, thanks, Tom. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say about that, you know, one of the things I really enjoy about comics, and that's evident from what we've said so far, is I love the collaborative aspect of it because I, I'd love to have somebody to bounce ideas off. And, you know, the, 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 there is that thing they say that if you're in a good collaboration, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You know, you get, you get more than you could have done if you just For done sure. it yourself. But the, the originals, it was my story about what had happened to me, written by me, drawn by me, lettered by me, grey tone by <laughs> me, graphic design by me. So it virtually meant I sat in a room on my own for two years doing this work. And at that time, we were in between moving houses and I had this kind of attic studio where you couldn't even it had a skylight but you couldn't see the the street you couldn't see people so it's like being in this monastic cell and i got quite this disheartened because even if you had a good week and did maybe four pages there'd still be another 120 to go and i actually got i, I found it really really hard and uh, it was great and i suppose i'm now turning this into a self-serving story but we i did eventually oh, win an eisner award for it which was great and again oh. I think it was just because i hadn't had one recently and they've been nice. <laughs> but, but my wife and my recently friend, he says i haven't had one recently you poor thing <laughs> yeah, i'm sorry you had it you had it oh, that sounds much more arrogant <laughs> than i meant it to say <laughs> But the good thing was that my wife and my teen, teenage stepdaughters at the, at the time, who put up with a lot of my bad temperedness and angst, were actually there to think, oh. well, it did matter. You know, you, you did, it did matter to the rest of the world, even through those dark days when you thought it didn't. So, yeah. When you're doing something for yourself that you wrote, do you change it? Would you, do you write your script out first or do you, are you more improvisational when you're drawing or...? Do you stick by like, yeah. oh, Dave Gibbons from two months ago told me to draw this. What the fuck was that Dave Gibbons thing? Well, yeah, I mean, again, I, I do. I'm a, I'm a great believer in doing things in the right order and properly. You know, I do have my own rules. And one of those things is, you know, never kid yourself that you'll fix it in the inks. You know, it's a bit <laughs> like you'll fix it in post. It, it's shit, but we'll fix it in post. No, writers do that. We'll fix it in letters. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't think this works, but this deadline's here. I'll, when I get the letters off, and then the letters come, I was like, I have no idea how to fix this. Yeah. So, but but I found it's best that, that to do each stage fairly conscientiously. So if I was writing a script for myself, I wouldn't go into such, I wouldn't be so florid or so descriptive as I would be for somebody else. But I would know what was happening in the picture. And I would figure out the dialogue beforehand, even if it could later be changed. And I must say, it, we're doing the originals. Once I'd done, once I'd written the script, I probably didn't change more than five percent of it. And really? that's quite often, um, you know, because it grammatically was wrong or something like that. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, I would tend to stick to that. So coming back to our scheme. I've written the script now, and then the next thing I would do would be to thumbnail it out. I'd, I'd, I, I now would know what, what if I was if I was drawing a script somebody else had written for me, or drawing my script that I'd written for me, but not if it was being drawn by somebody else. Because one of the worst things you can do to, to an artist is to give them a sketch of how you think it might be. Because as an artist, once you've seen that sketch, that's the only way you can imagine it. 
which is which is why you know your your Batman collaborators must have a terrible trouble when they see your <laughs> frankly I'm sorry to tell them, crappy Batman drawings. Oh, oh here oh. I'm interviewing you. You're insulted. I see how right. I'm trying to be honest oh with God. you. I'm, I'm paying you the respect of extreme honesty, Tom. I'm trying to help you in your career. Wow. My heartbreaking. That's what it is. Okay. Okay. I mean, they're heartfelt. They're spirited attempts. You know, I've been stuck inside for two years doing my own creator, own drawn work. Um, so I don't know. Maybe it won't win me a recent Eisner, but I'll do yeah. what I can. I'm sorry. I was no, 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 I get it. So too you, arrogant you... before. I'm being too harsh now. I'm, I just can't get the tone of this interview right. It's, it's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so if I was then drawing the comic, I would thumbnail it. And I do these tiny little, you, you've probably seen them before if you've seen my books on how to do things. I do these kind of postage stamp little thumbnails of the entire book. And I take quite a lot of time doing those and, and make sure that they told the story. That actually is the bit where the magic happens. What I was going on about earlier, you know, it's the bit in between the words and the pictures where it really happens. Your thumbnails are actually that point where you're you're gelling everything. You're actually making making the compound, and, and if you've done those properly, then by the time you draw, you thumbnail the last page, you can look at the whole thing. And if you squint, it's almost like you've got the comic book in front of you. And then all you need to do is bring it into focus. All you need to do is actually draw it, which means solving all the problems of human anatomy, composition perspective you know all all those things but those are drawing problems as distinct from storytelling problems so would you work with uh, frank miller Alan Moore, people who started out drawing comics before they're writing they never have sort of been like this is how you should do it and they sort of like f famously graham morrison claims that when he does a script he draws the complete script and then throws out the drawings and just sends in his writing did, have they have you ever had you've never had writers be like this is how you do it and just draw it out for you? no i mean i have seen um alan moore's um sketchbooks because he would draw out every page but he never ever showed me what he'd drawn out for his really <laughs> i was i was around his house and i saw some i forget what the comic book was but it was some things that he'd done for other people but they were really only stick figures and i think lots of writers do that they'll just do little stick figures just to kind of do an impression of what it would be like um and and as a point of honor there was a th thing there was a mini series i did with steve rude that i wrote and, and he drew and there was one bit of the description that he just couldn't get and i thought i'm not going to draw it for him i'm going <laughs> to describe it to him. so i described it to him and he still didn't get it and then i tried again and he still didn't get it and then i drew it for him and went, oh now i get it dave yeah that's easy thanks you know so it's a it's a real point of honor not to resort to a drawing because it feels like you're not if you have to draw it you're not you're not a writer anymore you're a sort of a scribbler you know see i was lucky enough not to have any artist skills at all so i don't even have that chance so if an artist were going to they they they'll, they'll know there's no actual skill i've seen scott snyder scripts he'll actually draw a little bit like this is kind of a design element but for me i'm just like good luck i this is what's in my head and if you can't understand it uh yeah i think that's the best approach yeah oh, see exactly nailed it yeah. by incompetence that's, yeah, how I, yeah. that's how I uh we've gone pretty far do you want do you want to keep talking about this i want to talk about first issues you write incredible first issues uh and you've drawn martha washington's incredible first issue uh watchman originals how do you approach a first issue what is a first issue needed whoa well, I suppose in a way, the first issue, although you maybe pitched the idea and you spent your whole life trying to get some sort of reputation, the the first <laughs> issue is the pitch. It's like if they don't like the first issue, they're not going to like the rest. Well, not necessarily, but generally speaking, they're not going to like the rest of it. But first issues can be difficult because first issues are difficult if they're origin stories. I mean, origin stories are kind of... You, I, I hate origin. I want to get to the meat of it, you know, which is why I think quite often movie trilogies, it's the second one, which is the sweetest one, because the first one is the origin and the second one is the sweet one. Like with the original Superman movies, my favourite is Superman 2. I guess with, with Alien, it's Aliens is, is, is my favourite. You know, it's it's so a first issue, if it's going to be an origin story, is really difficult for me. I think the way to do it is to not make it an origin story, but to make it a story that happens to lead to something, you know. Um, 
So well, in when the you did when you did Everything King's Men, the first issue, he's not uh, he's not a super spy by the end of the issue. You're just reading about some grumpy kid and he's in a bad situation. I was amazed at how little origin story was in that first issue of King's Men. Yeah, I suppose in some cases you're not telling the story of the origin, like who he is and who he how he came to be, as much as describing the world. And as you mentioned earlier on with Watchmen, it's the it, you incite a kind of murder mystery, which means that one of our characters is our kind of avatar, and he goes around the world, and you meet everybody, and you see everything, and you glimpse enough of the incidentals to think, ah, this is what we're in for. There's one thing that I often do before a first issue, and I did it in the case of Watchmen, did it in the case of Martha Washington as well. In fact, it would be too disruptive, but I could show you a big piece of artwork from Martha. But I, I is it for sale? Well, um, my dog is excited about it. Yeah, the, the dogs love it. The dogs love my work. <laughs> they'll chew it. They'll lie on it. They just love it. <laughs> um, but what I quite often do is do a page, a page like a page zero, which is not from the story, but is what a page is going to look like because I do try and give projects that I work on a different look like what Watchmen has obviously got as I'm sure you've noticed Tom and a nine panel grid you know <laughs> what? Yeah. mind blown yeah it's there if you look, if you look you can see it um, um and um you know I knew it had to have that distinctive look so I did a page zero for Watchmen which has appeared in print anyway but it's kind of a nine panel grid showing the kind of picture content and the lettering style and everything. It's almost like, uh, so I, I, rem I remember at the Eisner's once I said, Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I stole the nine panel grid from you. And you said, I fly stole it from Steve Ditko. Why, why did you decide nine panels was the way to go? I mean, I'm sure I want to know, but I know you've been asked that before. Well, nine panels on a page looks, it's a nice, if you divide pages in half, it's boring because everything matches, but thirds, it's like that compositional rule of thirds thing. It's an odd number, so it's more in interesting. The corners, the internal corners of it sit in the thirds, obviously, so it looks, it sort of sits on the page nicely. And it's probably about the right size to put a little unit of story in. And it also has the effect, as again, you and everybody else, and Steve Dick himself noticed, once you establish a grid, if you break the grid or you join two or three pictures together, the pictures look immense. Yeah, Whereas yeah, yeah. in a regular comic, it, it really wouldn't look that much. I mean, the reason I did that was almost as a, because Watchmen came out in the in the days of what I would call uh, poster designs for comic book pages, where you get one money shot of a hero and a load of little dialogue pictures. And that had become how comics were done. And I wanted to do something that looked different from that. And also, I, I wanted to do something that would enable a very complicated story to be told slightly simply, slightly more simply in the, the in the uh, format, you know. Um, but then when it came to do Martha Washington, that's completely free form. There are no grids going on in there at all. So that gives that that distinctive look. So in the case of Martha, I, I did a sample where everything had, you know, sort of bled off the page or was more dynamically composed. And if I can do that again, it's like the doing the thumbnails and squinting at it, and you can more or less see the finished comic. If you've done a page zero, you can think, yeah, yeah, this is what a finished page from that series is going to look like. And then you can draw issue one, page one, with a little bit more assurance. Do you talk to the editor about this? Or this is like, I know how this is going to... Because every time you share something with the editor, you're risking losing a little bit of yourself. But you, you, you might get reassurance, but you also might get this turned down. What do you share? What don't you share? Well, in the case of Watchmen or um, Martha Washington, really, editors didn't come into it at all. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, people were credited as editors, but I'm sure that they would agree with me that what they did was really make sure the trains ran on time, that there were no sort of spelling errors or there was nothing that just didn't work. But as for the idea of editorial input, we didn't ask for it, it wasn't offered and everybody was very happy at that. And I mean, in the case of Watchmen, about the first that they see of it at DC would be when the finished ink lettered pages and the color guides arrived in a package. Um, <laughs> and they, never, they changed, there were a couple of 
places where they changed dialogue and they actually made it worse. And so we then had to change it back. There's one particular panel where it was re-lettered and pasted up. Really? Four or five times. It's it's the one, it's where they just crash landed the owl ship in the in the Antarctic. And there's something about Night Owl gets his little hover scooters out and there's a bit of banter about rem remember that time you came out of that tunnel on one of these, all the rats running in front of you. Or this some piece of dialogue like that and it was changed by the editor and changed back by Alan and then changed back and then changed back again and the one that it, it's the only time it happened and I don't know you know sometimes you get really focused on something and it just becomes something that you can't get rid of mm -hmm. that panel like that but in the final absolute watchman it's the correct um, original script version of the dialogue so all you nerds out there you can go and have a close look at that in, in that book behind you yes uh, I, I I had the pleasure of of, of uh, sitting with Len, Len Wein for a while, and it was at a time in my career when I was trying to do ambitious things, and I noticed that editors really didn't want to do ambition, especially at the sort of big two companies. They you know they they don't they don't you know if you, if you say to them, hey man, I have this idea for this layout, and this will mirror this other layout, and they're like that that sounds like it's going to affect your deadline. Don't you know like like that? And I asked I, I asked Len Wein, I said, how did you? How did Watchmen work? How are you able to do something? I mean, because it's twenty-four pages, no commer no no commercials. You couldn't do that today, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and you had front and back cover control, which we very rarely have these. And I asked him how, and he he said he said I had pitched Teen Titans and they hated it. They said it was a total failure, and and Wolfman and Perez were going to go down in flames, and that was their biggest hit ever. So when I went with them, Watchmen, they just thought I was talking about the same thing, and they let me do it. That was his. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think the thing with Watchmen as well, and, and the thing generally with creator-owned stuff, I mean, Watchmen wasn't creator-owned, but Martha Washington and other stuff was was creator-owned, is that, say, coming back to the case of Watchmen, they were characters that didn't mean anything. And, and you know, as you know, some of them died, some of them went, went, went crazy. Um, but it wasn't like we were going to do that with Batman or we were going to do that with Green Lantern, where obviously they want a little bit more editorial input. I mean, they had nothing to lose. So they just left us alone to do. And I think also, you know, Alan, he made such a huge difference. He completely turned around Swamp Thing. I mean, that was just mind boggling what he managed to do with that. So he was their golden boy and they knew that I was reliable and that I, you know, I wouldn't draw anything too shabby. So <laughs> I think, I think, and I loved Len, I worked with Len, but I, I think if Len knew that the decent product was going to come out that he didn't have to spend too much time on, then he'd be very happy with it. <laughs> it's the editor's yeah. calling, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it makes a ton of sense. Uh, um, so we're getting towards the end. So now I get to ask you just a few questions. Would you rather live in uh, Martha Washington's future world or our current future or our current world? <laughs> I'd rather live, I think, basically. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, we certainly didn't see, we saw a lot of things coming, but we didn't see these particular circumstances coming. I mean, but it, it is weird and lots of people have drawn attention to it. There's cert certain aspects that we were right on the money with. And I mean, we did that like 30 years ago. Uh, the must, Frank must have been tuned into something and I must have seen pictures from the future or something like that. It, it is quite uncanny. I, I wouldn't agree. Be on anybody, but uh, yeah, it's strange how life imitates art. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, read, I read it all in one gap, and you really can't because there's a it's over twenty years from the first issue to sort of when she dies. Oh, spoilers! Uh, but <laughs> now, now nobody's going to buy it now, Tom, because they know what happens. You've given the plot away. No one will see the movie when you make this brilliant movie someday. Uh, oh, sorry. Yo, I, oh, I didn't know anything. This is complete guessing. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it felt to me very much because it was it felt so contemporary. I couldn't tell what was written in the eighties or in the nineties or in the aughts because it all felt like it was talking to the now. It was talking to current issues of sort of politics and reality TV and all that stuff. I, I, I was blown away by just how dead on you were. It was, I mean, you just you, you just missed the plague. That's all. But I feel like there was hints of it. Well, it would have been one plot thread too too many. I think as <laughs> we're discovering, you know. I did notice. This is just a very small thing. The, in 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 the book, Frank Miller dedicates the like third volume to Ayn Rand, 
saying yeah. she was my huge inspiration. And I always think of Watchmen and Rorschach as a parody of Ayn Rand as saying, what a crazy person this is. And I was wondering what it, what it must be like to be on sort of both sides of the, these two writers who come at this one philosopher from two different ways. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I think sometimes by expounding people's philosophies, you can illustrate the shortcomings in them. So I think just because you deal with a certain writer, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that you personally admire them or would emulate them or would recommend them. But I, I suppose what what Martha was about was how do you order society if it all breaks down? And obviously the Randian thing is one way of looking at it. And also because it inherently is a very black and white philosophy, somebody like Rorschach with his reductive worldview would be attracted to it, you know? So it kind of, yeah, I, again, it's something that's floating around, isn't it, that you... You almost, if you're talking about dystopias or you're talking about things gone wrong, you're going to be mentioning things like that. I see things in Martha Washington that I think are almost not a commentary on Watchmen. It's sort of frank. I mean, there's a plot line of like, let's unite the whole world. If we create a bad incident, Martha has to, Martha has to prevent it. He almost puts the Watchmen plot in in a later episode. Mm -hmm. um, was this on purpose or do you think Frank was just riffing it just over? Well, I'm I mean... Sorry. You know, we spoke earlier about plot number one, the the, the quest. I mean, the, there is philosophical proposition number one, probably. It's like, uh, um, it's a bit like my, my f about uniting against a common enemy. Uh, and I mean, the thing about Watchmen is it's kind of, well, if there's this fifth dimensional squid menace, we've got to stick together, you know. Uh, and a similar situation in Martha. Um, and um, I mean, I'm sure that must have been going in biblical times, in Greek times, in Chinese times be before that, that, yeah, you might hate somebody, but if there was a threat to both of you, you would unite with them. So I think it's, again, it's almost, you almost can't avoid coming up with that kind of stuff if you're getting into that kind of geopolitical kind of thing. So I, I've been told that I have to wrap it. I could talk to you for 15 hours about all this stuff. Uh, is there anything uh, you would like to plug or tell people to look at or say something, you know, go out there and buy this or do anything, so any, anything out there you want to talk to the audience about that I didn't mention? Well, the thing that I ha have spent some time working on, and I actually finished writing it a year or more ago, is my autobiography, which, um, you know, I, I think the world's finally ready for it. Um, and it's, I think it should be of interest to people. It was really that I've had so many, I think, interesting um, experiences in comics. And I've also been really lucky to meet and to work with so many people who have been pivotal in comics, which is the field that I've dedicated my life to, which I, from being a child, have, have, have loved. That I thought it'd be interesting to give a kind of behind the scenes view. So I've done this autobiography, which is not a chronological autobiography. It's kind of anecdotal. It's anecdotes arranged in alphabetic, an alphabetical, uh, um, uh, what, what am I it's an alphabetical anecdotal autobiography. <laughs> that sounds and, amazing. And when it's about it? 100,000 words. It's going to have lots of pictures in it as well, which will tend to be things of mine that people haven't seen or are very familiar with. It will be obscure stuff I've done right at the beginning of my career and advertising stuff and foreign language stuff that I've done during my career. We spent some time with one publisher and we couldn't really get going anywhere, but it's now with another publisher. I'll say no more than that. It's, it's with another publisher who are gung-ho to publish it. So I'm hoping that once present operational difficulties are resolved a bit, we can get that autobiography out there. In which case, it would be a pleasure to do an interview or a chat with you again, Tom, after you've had a chance to internalize that and ask me some interesting questions based on, on that. I would love to. I, first, I'd I just love to read the autobiography and I'd love to talk to you about the autobiography. I, I'll be first in line to get that book. I cannot wait to read it. I, I, I've talked long enough. We went our whole time. We didn't even get to how to end a story. So good luck starting it. Now we have no advice on how to finish it. Um, well, it was good. I'm, I'm surprised that the time went so quickly. We obviously were enjoying ourselves. And yeah, let's find an excuse to, to do it again another time. And I'd, I'd really love to chat to you about some of the wonderful things that you've 
been involved with. So uh, we'll do it again soon. You're so nice. Uh, how about how about a wonderful day? You too, uh, Tom. Take care. I assume someone's going to take us away. <laughs>